okay let's go so like i haven't touched uh, the material for a very long time i just want a refresher and probably you guys too so let's just go right so he said everything after exam 2 or whatever the last exam was that will be there so when was that i don't know but let's see the the last tutorials they were on um, the binary algebra stuff and what else was there the flip-flop thing well that wasn't having a tutorial actually and what else was there i don't know mm -hmm. so this was before exam and mm, okay nope nope small signal analysis of the diode all oh, right so diodes were there as well uh, yeah, these are the PDFs. Fine. Wait, where's screen copy? Uh, I'm pretty sure screen copy was supposed to be. Yeah. Right, here it is. Alright, let's start. Small signal model of the diode. What does the diode look like or whatever? We don't care about any of that no 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 right so the main thing that he wants to say is this equation so the current through the diode is uh, capital i d e power v d upon n v t where v t is the thermal voltage which is a constant for the diode uh, eta will be given to you i still don't know what that is probably related to the diode just you know it's geometry or whatever uh, v d is the dc current so, sorry the dc voltage yeah i think so and id is the dc current right yep and this thing is also the dc current well that's weird okay so vd plus so signal component of the voltage oh oh so it's, this d does not represent the dc part it actually represents just you know diode it's passing through a diode so this is a uh, this is the ac part of the actual voltage right so this is not dc it's actually ac Oh, and this is the, yeah, this is the DC current. And this is actually just the diode current. It's not like the DC current. Fine. So that's, you know, the main equation over there. Everything else you don't have to look at. I mean, this was the actual equation. IS is called the saturation current. So this was ID equal to IS E power VD upon uh, eta VT. And this was under some constraint, which was like, where did constraint go? Yeah. Uh, no again okay. not this I think it was something else right so it of course uh, these small signals there was also some other thing going on mm, none of that is what we want yeah but there was this uh, other thing that was used in the approximation i don't know where he wrote that ah whatever so the main thing is that the diode current which i'll just be calling small i to you know not cause a bunch of confusion so small i that's equal to the diode uh, dc current right um which i'll actually call small i d not capital i t once again to not cause confusion and then you got e power all of that stuff so once again that was e power uh, the ac part so i actually you know write it as ac upon eta and then the, the thermal voltage so this is um, this thing is actually related to the diode and not to the circuit this is of course the the ac current right so the signal that's passing through a diode and yeah well that is it in fact this is the whole ac analysis thing so all you have to do is just figure out the dc current first and once you have that apply this equation to get the ac current now what you could do is you know since your um what do you call it like yeah since this thing is pretty small you could approximate it using the Taylor expansion and then say okay this thing is just id plus oh right so this is not actually the ac current instead what i should say is the it's a total current so i'll just write total current right so i total is equal to id times 1 plus 
VAC upon eta Vt. Yep. So uh, that will just be and yeah. So Vd it's the is the AC part. Fine. So this is just Id plus Id times VAC upon eta Vt, and that's what this thing is. So then I total minus Id is just the AC part. So IAC that is equal to Id. So the DC part, uh, then the AC voltage upon eta and then thermal voltage. Right. So how do you figure out the AC current? Just figure out the DC current first and then do this thing to get that. Right. Easy as that. Um, also notice that this thing is more or less constant. Uh, so what you have is that uh, like okay so if your AC current so if your DC current is also constant that is you've already figured out that value and it's constant then what you could say is that your AC current is linearly related to the AC voltage and then you can call um, this whole value eta VT upon IDC thing as something called you know R and then say okay VAC equal to R IAC and yeah there you go so this is the resistance in case of the ac analysis right so this is called rd i don't know why he uses these weird subscripts but whatever that's what he basically wants to say that uh this is actually behaving like a resistance in the in case of ac of course and small signal and some other restriction which i forgot about <laughs> right you don't have to look partial differentiation or whatever just know the context and then normal differentiation is also partial differentiation. Okay, that's weird whatever uh, consider this circuit power supply okay we don't want examples or anything so yeah the main thing that we should do is just do that uh, DC analysis so um, yeah like the thing is diodes have um, a drop of themselves so like for example if you have some current going through a diode then there will be a drop of uh, 0 0.7 like this is a silicon diode then that's gonna happen for an ideal diode this is 0 and so I don't know let's say that your voltage across it that you actually applied was V you have some resistor over here so this is the DC value right this is the R uh, resistance that you applied and this involves its internal resistance as well I'm not writing that explicitly so then we are assuming that this has 0 resistance for now so this is <coughs> right um, so then the current through it which is the DC current uh, that will just be you know V minus 0 0.7 upon R and let's say that this is not just V but instead of that you also have some AC component so let's say the AC component is small V <laughs> yeah then the AC current that will just be small V upon R but how do you figure out R remember R was basically um, oh well I actually forgot the formula for that I just wrote it moments ago but no worries he has that written for us right yeah yep he has that written for us somewhere uh, what is this RD equal to whatever we don't care about oh right so RD equal to eta VT upon ID fine so ID we already know is just this and then what's eta we don't know vt we don't know but it's just this thing it's eta vt upon id is this thing so it's just v minus 0 0.7 r goes on the top that's what this thing is uh yeah uh this is the value for r so the ac current that's just equal to small v upon r and like just calculate whatever this value is we get the thing and this is the capital V thing it's not small v so it's small v upon r uh, times capital V minus 0 0.7 upon eta v thermal r cool next and all of this is just examples we don't have to look at that all right cool next diode rectifier limit small signal oh so it's again the same thing that's weird Uh, oh it's actually the same in fact yeah you don't want that oh this is just little diodes 
write their IV characteristics and all that stuff. Very uninteresting. I don't like it. Yep, not looking at any of it. Oh, so he's actually getting to logic gates now? I think so. Okay, P injunction diode IV characteristic. Fine, whatever. Short circuit, reverse pass, rectifier. So the usual calculation rate of rectifier is uh, pretty common. It can be found anywhere. So I won't be explaining any of that. Logic operations. Okay, first shows us an OR gate. Okay, so V and VB, and then you have these two diodes. <coughs> and then it's resistor, and then you got V naught. So current flows in the circuit, and a voltage is therefore generated across R if either or both the diodes conduct. Okay. Uh, oh, and this kind of uh, thing is actually like pretty common. So what could happen is that you you don't have just uh, two of these guys but actually you have like multiple of these guys so oh uh, let's just actually you know once again try to remember what I wrote in the last page what was that formula it was just eta VT upon uh, upon what upon ID right yeah so the DC voltage yep that was the value for the AC resistance right so just remember that and that was you know the whole thing that you wanted to say in that lecture nothing else was important anyway so all he was saying was just do the DC analysis figure out RD to the DC analysis and you are done you know the circuit all right what about this one so say you have like a bunch of voltages a b c d whatever and let's say that b is the biggest uh, voltage out of these right and you connect each of these through a diode and let, let's just say it's the same diode right so the same silicon diode so 0 0.7 volt and all that stuff and this is going through some resistor this thing is v naught output voltage and this is ground 0 volt whatever this current going through there so what's going to happen is that the biggest voltage that will be the only one with current flowing because uh, because that voltage will pretty much be carried over here because this this is the 0.7 uh, volt drop and nothing else so yeah that will be pretty much just carried over there because every other voltage will be less than that so it's reverse biased and so yeah you can just you know make sure that on the first guess itself it's the correct guess and you just know how it is right so really this is not an OR gate is it I don't think so I mean I get it if both of these are low values then well nothing happens of course if any one of these is high values then that is the voltage that is used and in that case this goes I get it but you know mm, I don't like this like it is still drawing current from the from this uh, source of this voltage right that's not supposed to happen uh, so I don't like this next this is an AND gate okay so here's the same voltage attached to both of these cool so if either or both diodes conduct uh, the output would be a very low value therefore if you want the output to be nearly equal to 5 volt you would need V and VB to be equal to 5 volt <laughs> yeah so if both are equal to 5 volt then this happens and oh this just something less than 5 volt that is all we know about it Oh, well, it could be it's more than 5 volt, right? Because then the current would just go like that. Uh, yeah, I don't think that's going to happen because it can't flow reverse. So the only way current could flow is like that and like that, which means it's only going to go from this node, right? From this node, it can only go. Right. So yeah, he's right that if both of these are 5 volt, nothing happens. Otherwise, current goes. So, so yeah in that case this voltage will pretty much be zero if any of these is low and if that is like five this is low then this is reverse pass so nothing happens across that diode as well so yeah can you make a not gate no you can't you need a transistor for that next physical operation of diodes we don't care about that 
no seriously you should not care about this like i made videos on this stuff but you really should should just not care oh this is like the space stars reason and yeah okay depletion region that's what they call it but okay like just for explaining actually i'm gonna explain how diodes exactly work so you got this pn junction um over here you got molecules molecules i should say basically like yeah i don't know just just some lattice with uh with holes in it so like electrons would naturally want to jump in there but then when they jump they create charge so like thermodynamically it's better for them to be jumping but then eventually what happens is that you have these charges created so this is all negative this is positive and that creates a field in this region so the field is going in that direction which means that it wants to push electrons in this region so now they can't like jump so even if they want to they can't because now it's thermodynamically favorable so um yeah how is this related to conduction and all that stuff so let's say that so this is uh, p this thing is n so this is uh, what's called like it's inbuilt voltage or whatever um let's say that you forward bias okay first of all let's go for reverse bias to you know make sure you understand what's going on so this is negative this thing is positive right um yeah so what i basically said was initially let's say that the potential was you know not there like if there was no potential what would happen is that these electrons would uh, naturally jump from n to p right and that would create a potential in this direction right this would be positive this would be negative over here you know that the potential is already in that direction and so electrons really just you know um wait what is it that i was saying oh yeah okay i shouldn't say potential. it should be field and all that stuff right yeah so this is higher potential this is lower potential so electron go to higher potential already um right and they have thermodynamic tendency to be going into the p region so then these two tendencies balance each other out over here you have a very high like much higher positive charge over there and this is negative charge so you need uh yeah so so all that's going to happen is like the region will be bigger yeah i wait i think i messed up somewhere right this is not going to be explainable in th in this manner you need some you need some equations and all that to be able to explain this actually you can't just explain it you know with pictures and words i think i have made videos on that so you can definitely watch that and that would help okay what does he have to say with the depletion region is it anything neutral negative charge positive charge okay whatever yeah so these are the uh, concentrations kind of yeah for the so yeah a and d was related to like positive negative right was it related to what i think i i even i used a and d in my derivation so it was something like uh was something like that so something like cathode anodes i don't exactly remember what it was but yeah this was a this was d fine so this is the n region this is the p region you have these a molecules over here and you have d molecules over here and these give them electron right so let's put in the q a q is the charge of electron i think over there then capital a is this area right okay he's just telling us that outside of it like outside of this um, depletion region what should happen is that electric field should be zero because it behaves kind of like a capacitor and because of that this happens and also the repetition region width is given by this thing square root of hey this is very similar to the equation you know what i actually have that thing let me just check if that is the equation that i once got uh so it was somewhere over here yeah okay no this where is it field max delta v equal to this stuff 
right so d is that uh yeah so you got delta v equal to half d e max which is e d squared so d is this complete distance which is the distance of the depletion region then c a c d so instead of n a and n d i am using c a and c d which are concentrations n a and d are number concentrations so this is like yeah uh, there is i think a bit of a difference in in these c and c d are slightly different did i use n a and d anywhere else no i did not ha ah, then maybe they are the same i guess yep so in my derivation c a c d were just concentrations if i remember correctly so then this was the equation so basically just had ed square upon 2 epsilon and then 1 upon ca plus 1 upon cd right that's equal to delta v so then oh that is very similar to what i got wow hey it's exactly the same in fact wait so i did the same derivation way way long ago uh okay i was not expecting that fine i guess mm 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 oof well i was really just not expecting that uh, okay Oh yeah so now things are starting to come back so what was the thing basically what was happening was as electrons pass through this depletion region they are basically going through some uh, voltage right so the bigger is the depletion region bigger is the voltage and uh, also when they are passing through the wire that's also basically a, a voltage difference they are passing through so when they are passing through the wire right and we are like doing in reverse bias so p is connected to negative n is connected to positive so electrons are of course going from p to n no okay it should be the reverse so n to p and then <coughs> and then from p to n but through the wire right so n to p um yeah that's that's unfavorable so they are going to a to a, a lower potential and electrons going to a lower potential means going to a higher potential energy right so yeah that happens and then they are also going to the wire but then when when they are going to the wire they are actually going to a higher potential so remember n is at a higher potential p is at a lower potential so that um yeah that's what happens right they go through that right and then there is the cell you you have because okay but actually in my whole derivation i didn't consider the cell because thermodynamics right i was only considering the system and the surrounding so the cell wasn't even in the picture but yeah what is the thing and then the electrons go like that so this gives energy change associated with this thing and that thing won't they just cancel out uh no in fact they will cancel out so at equilibrium that's what's going to happen right yeah net change of that electron moving through it is right so that's pretty much zero and that's what should happen so then what was thing the voltage was there wow i really have to revise all of this okay let us actually go through that right so uh, one of the main assumptions was that the concentrations of uh, charge so like concentration of um of like these free charge carriers electrons and holes is constant throughout these regions i mean it's just that the formula like they are exactly the same and that is the reason i'm actually going in more depth over here right so this is actually very much not related to gibbs energy or whatever so this this is like true that yeah the voltage difference across the depletion region that is related to the uh, to the distance so like the thickness of the depletion region by this so this formula is going to be correct whether or not we deal with thermodynamics and so is this formula because it just relies on electrostatics right yeah okay this is where the thing comes in so uh, delta ve is called the built in potential fine j 
just a lot of patients only gives the uh, energy change of the reaction is constant as constant temperature for this reaction at equilibrium delta g equal to e delta v mm -hmm. that is weird hey wait, wait 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 i think i'm getting it oh yeah so the thing is chemical potentials are different over there apparently but no we used to think that the liquid is actually going from the edge where the chemical potentials are in fact the same right so then those would just cancel out so that's not the reason i mean in the end it's just going from n to p and then back right or not i guess not actually wait yeah i think that's the case it's not actually doing that it really isn't isn't it mm -hmm. so what's basically happening is that your electron right it, it's going from n to p which is at equilibrium so right it needs some potential like okay chemical potential that changes and also the electric potential so that changes for the electron as well and those two things balance out but then one electron should also move from p to n because otherwise there will be um, an imbalance right uh, no 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 okay right so right the process that we're talking about is not conduction what we're talking about is charging up the diode so yeah okay okay you don't have to move that electron from p to n right okay so let me just go back to that rough page and explain what's going on so you don't need all of this this is mainly for conduction right so you don't need this battery uh, oh so this is reverse bias as well fine yep it gets thicker and uh, all of that stuff so where was the main equation that i wrote it was delta g equal to e delta v e so delta v e is the uh yeah okay it's what is delta v e electrons naturally migrate right and they build up a certain potential delta v e okay this delta v thing v thing is called the built-in potential okay next i took the example of attaching conductive wires to it and then i took the example of you know attaching a battery so all of that is unnecessarily complicated i think but at the time i thought it was the most rigorous way of proving it so i did that uh but yeah okay let me just show you the main thing so let's go back to the rough page i don't know why i'm doing this it's not even related to the course at all actually it is i mean look at all of this but fine so the thing i was saying was so you have this uh pn junction over here What's happening is, so naturally what happens is that electrons migrate from N to P creating positive and negative charges for it, which uh, creates a reverse electric field uh, which opposes this migration and then you get stability. And what we mean by stability is that this process becomes um, uh, reversible, like it, it is at equilibrium at this point. And when that happens, your delta G, which was the change in gives free energy for let's say like one mole of electrons migrating right although it's more like a derivative and less of what actually happens when one mole electrons migrate which would be stupid because we know that does not happen it's a derivative right it's a figurative way of saying so delta g equal to um nfe <laughs> that's that's pretty much it so n in this case is just one so just uh, defined as constant times so the electric field that's created over there oh wait no okay in that case uh, it was actually the voltage so i'm gonna say fv I know some people would not like this notation but in this case we are using V everywhere so FV right so V is the voltage difference across the depletion region um, so delta G equal to yeah Faraday's constant times the voltage difference and from that you can get the voltage difference right so that's the inbuilt voltage now what happens if you connect a battery so we are doing it uh, this in reverse bias so this will be negative this will be positive so let's say uh, we call this uh, v cell right so once again this is going to be in um, what do we call it equilibrium 
but now you have delta g equal to f times so not just v instead so uh, once again let's actually def, uh, determine whether or not the voltage is increasing in that direction or decreasing so it's positive this is going in that direction this thing is decreasing so this is a higher voltage this thing so yeah that's a higher voltage this thing is so it's supposed to be vc minus uh, wait what yeah that's more positive charge thrown in yeah okay okay this is actually correct so it's just vc it's not actually vc so this let's say that that thing is voltage v so this is just v right yeah so as you go like that you have a voltage drop of v and keep going you have a voltage drop drop of uh, negative vc so then it's just v minus vc uh, voltage drop as you go through the loop and that's that's going to be the non pv work done and that's equal to delta g as well so what that means is uh, so well, delta g is still the uh, the same thing right because these things like these um, areas outside of the depletion region well they are still having the same properties they are unaffected what like completely although their voltage has changed right which we have accounted for other than that um, they are you know completely unrelated so delta g is still the same all right so delta g equal to f v minus v c uh yeah what was i saying then what was i even saying yeah right so what that means is like v equal to delta g upon f plus v c but remember that v is uh, actually related to the to the you know this thickness of our depletion region so yeah the depletion region width w was given by this formula so if this thing increases and this is actually what they're calling v naught so call this v naught over here so if v naught increases then so does this thickness and when does v naught increase that's hap that's happening when vc increases so if you put a very big battery uh, in reverse bias what will happen is that your voltage will cause this depletion region to uh, become wider and that's like charging a capacitor makes sense right when you charge a capacitor it doesn't have any kind of non linear character. like it's not non linear but in this case this is more or less a non linear capacitor so this is a capacitor charging you have positive and negative um, you know sides of the cell and that creates some charge on your capacitor plates which creates um, an electric field in this direction although this thing right right yeah in this direction uh, but then the electrons can't move over there right so electrons can't go from this direction to that direction similar as this thing electrons or anything in fact cannot move from one side to the other because because you know <laughs> there are no uh, actual free charge carriers in the depletion region right what else was the thing oh yeah so also the electric field in these wires is zero similarly over here electric field in these regions is zero and that is that's why this equation is there right yeah uh, so yeah let's move on we don't want to spend too much time on this so what he said was typically w is approximately 0.1 micro i didn't know that my derivation was actually correct i just thought it would be nice to try and figure out what how is it behaving but it is actually correct it's actually the same thing as this wow nice okay so that's diodes then you got diode rectifiers half wave rectifier full wave rectifier bridge okay wow lots of stuff okay half wave rectifier everybody knows this move on full wave rectifier yeah 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 whatever oh so another thing to note is that um over here like since it's split at the middle the number of coils is actually half uh, the total number of coils so let's say that this one's like a 5 to 1 transformer now it's a 10 to 1 transformer when it's uh, actually conducting so you have to have that extra factor of half all right and what about this drop that's because of the diodes so the diodes also like when they are conducting they create a voltage drop right and that's the reason you get uh, 
these curves shifted vertically and there's this bridge rectifier thing okay so you got this voltage over there this is the ground plus and minus so taking across this resistor that's the output okay cool yeah it's a diode it's another diode that's another diode that's another diode So when this is like positive, this thing is negative. In that case, this is conducting. I guess. Yep. And when this is negative, this is positive. In that case, this is conducting. Makes sense. And so, yeah, it's like a full wave rectifier, but without that half factor thrown in. And uh, just so you know, that half factor does not actually mean that uh, the power is getting half because remember that only half of this is conducting but well that also means that the current is actually going to be two times uh, the the current that was there previously because you know conservation energy still follows it's a transformer right you know how it works okay then you got peak inverse voltage that's with a positive half cycle whatever at least you don't want to be doing any of that Okay, next. Rectify with full cap filter capacitor, peak rectifier. Wow, why do you have all of this stuff? Okay, so now you got a diode, but then there's a capacitor over there. Fine. So this was your input, this is your output. Oh, yeah, okay, this thing. They even put a tutorial for that, and it has some weird things going on over there. Do they have like general generalization of uh, these guys? Ah, right so this was actually the thing that I got as well so funny story they put this in a tutorial but then I didn't actually like read all of that so I had to derive all of that at that point which is weird <laughs> okay now this is the peak rectifier so this is what happens and yeah this is in fact what happens when you will analyze it correctly right so current ID going from this I see over there yeah, so you have an ideal diode assumption is that CR is much much bigger than T what is T oh, T is the time period fine so CR is the time constant uh, which is like e power I T upon CR right so that time constant is what I'm talking about for the discharging of the capacitor uh, right so what's happening is that there are regions where the capacitor is the only thing that you have to look for like that is the one that is uh, you know causing the current through the resistor the diode is not right uh, which is this region and there are regions where it uh, you know where it actually matches the VS thing so yeah it's those regions over there right yeah I guess that was the thing so right um, whenever your VS is growing and it's like growing really fast in that case your capacitor is catching up to your VS you could say so it's actually following it right um, so it's the same voltage at your VS but once your VS starts to uh, decrease and it's decreasing fast right it's not decreasing slow in that case your capacitor actually like it can't decrease that fast because it has a resistor on its side and it will actually discharge through that so if it uh, if it discharges slowly and it actually does discharge slowly sometimes it, it's so slow that this slope is actually the same thing as that slope. that is this exponential decay is more like linear decay over here so yeah it actually decays rather slowly and because of that the next time period happens and now the capacitor is once again just following your voltage source and so basically you just get a straight line over here and this is pretty nice don't you think so right so you have this you know curve which you have pretty much converted to a to a DC voltage 
although that's not what we wanted to do with you know these guys these rectifiers but yeah right so this is like ac to dc completely over there that was just ne uh, cutting down the negative part so both are doing different things yeah makes sense right so the diode current id equal to ic plus so this is important and in in the tutorial that uh, that were that asked this question uh, this actually didn't hit me at first but then i later realized that most of the current is actually going from the capacitor so the diode current uh, is due to two things the capacitor charging and uh, the current to the resistor so what you're seeing is that your uh, CR is much much bigger than T right so if like your CR is very big and the reason for that is that your, is that your R is very big in that case most of the current is actually just going through the capacitor right yeah so the condition is that R must be very big and in that case you can drop that term of course that's not gonna happen all the time and so this is the general formula that you're using it's a C uh, dVi upon dt so vi is uh, the input voltage so this is when the capacitor is following the uh, the voltage source and then plus i uh, l okay i uh, the current through the load that's what they are saying right so this current which is just you know vs upon r so yeah let me just write that down the diode current is just capacitance dvi upon dt where vi is the input voltage plus uh, vi upon r right and this is the graph yep so you can you can always approximate this as a straight line right yeah uh, next question What is this? What is all of this? Oh, it's the same thing that they're doing. To find the conduction interval. So they're the, they're doing it for the sinusoid. Oh, so in tutorial we were asked uh, for the triangular wave. So I guess a more general tactic I can tell you. So what I did in the tutorial was once again the same thing as what they are doing. Uh, just figure it out that so like in, in the tutorial it was basically a triangular wave um, so once the capacitor is charged up at this point uh, your voltage source st starts to decrease but your capacitor can't uh, decrease that fast in, instead it decreases um, at a slope of negative one and then this slope actually goes to something like uh, something like negative one point no wait it actually goes up right yeah so it was something like Wait, I don't actually remember what that was. Uh, wow, I really don't remember that. Something like negative zero point. No, it was one point something, right? Whatever, but mainly it's just exponential decay. That's what you have to know. So it's kind of like exponential decay. All right, so it does whatever it does, but it doesn't go up to that value where the capacitor is. So it mainly it's just the capacitor that's creating the current. And then it starts um, to go above the capacitor. That's when the capacitor realizes, oh shit, I have to go up. And then it uh, starts to follow the voltage source, right? Uh, so think of these, uh, so think of this exponential decay as a line. And then you know the slope over here, right? I mean, you know the voltage, you know the resistance. So basically, like you know what's the what's the rate at which the capacitor is discharging. So then you know the slope for this line. You also know the slope for that line do some basic geometry figure out what this value is going to be and yeah that's that's about it really that's all you have to do just think of this as a line rather than uh, as an exponential decay yep so even if this is like some some weird kind of wave i don't know some parabolic wave that doesn't make sense but it, say if it was actually something like that periodic parabolic wave even then you would be doing the same thing makes sense right next
Oh yeah, this is nice. Precision rectifier. Right. So you have the input, then you have this. It's an op amp, right? Yeah, okay. So op amp. This is a diode over there. V minus V naught. Yeah. If V I goes positive, the output V A goes positive, and it. Ah, uh, wait. This is different than the precision rectifier that came in the tutorial, right? I think so. Because over here the feedback is like it's going through a diode. There was no diode in that. It was there? Okay, I'll have to check the tutorial again instead. This is the VA over there. Uh, so the diode is ideal, right? The super diode. What? Could not work for input voltages less than the diode drop because the diode could never turn on the limit. Utility in many low signal applications. If VI goes positive, the output voltage VA goes positive, and if the diode turns on, uh, and a close feedback path exists, this negative feedback causes virtual short to appear between whatever, whatever. It's VI negative. Fine. Uh, wait. What do I want to do again? So okay, this is what we're doing. So. This VI versus VO. Yeah, I mean, okay. Given VI, I just figure out what VO is. I guess that's the thing. What's V minus though? They just assume V minus is zero. <laughs> yeah. Wait, what's VA over there? No idea. Where's the ground? One second. Bad circuits. Yep. 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 EE always has bad circuit diagrams for some reason. Limiting circuits. Also, all of this is like standard material. I was thinking like they put some good questions in tutorials. Apparently, it was all standard material. Eh, whatever. I guess I'll figure that out on on time. You know, it's not that hard. Okay, what is this? Digital electronics. Oh yeah, so this is a big, big, big part. There are a lot of lectures on this for no real reason. Actually, it's not that hard. Number system, of course, that's where to start. Completely useless. Any like everybody knows this. So yeah, two's complement, one's complement. Oh, okay. So this is not that useless actually. Okay. Wait, I thought he would actually be teaching number system first. I guess even he assumed that. Yeah, everybody knows that. Fine. So complements of numbers, pretty easy. Let's just start. Uh, do I even actually have to explain this? I don't know. I'm gonna do it anyway. So usually the um, the numbers in your computer they are stored using the uh, two's complement method. So how many bits should I be using? Let's just say I'm going to use eight bits. Okay. <coughs> so let's say that you are given eight bits and you want to represent both signed and uh, so like both positive and negative integers uh, using those eight bits. How do you do that? And what you could do is use um, the last bit, so the eighth bit, to represent the sign of um, of your number, right? And the way that we want to do that is using a bit of modular arithmetic. So, what you know is that so, uh, this is kind of weird, but okay. So we start off at zero, and we go all the way till two power eight. So we can actually, you know, translate all of these numbers down uh, by two power seven, and the new the new range that you will be getting is something like this. So this thing is two power seven uh, minus one. This thing is two power. So yeah, you have like used seven bits. That's why, right? So this is two power seven minus one, but negative. So you, yeah, this will be the range that you'll be getting. So there's zero somewhere over there. So you can represent all of these numbers. And the way th this will be having is that okay, every 
number over here is it's the same thing in this uh, system as well but these negative numbers those are actually mapped to uh, to these numbers by translating upwards so let's say that you want to represent um, I don't know negative 2 what you would do is you would add uh, 2 power not add well yeah actually add so you would add uh, 2 power 7 I think to it 7 right no 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 2 power 8 yeah so you would add 2 power 8 to it and then the number that you would be getting is uh, somewhere over here right so that's the one so right I mean these are the same right actually you didn't actually translate it down like that oh, okay actually I'm gonna start again because it's getting a bit messy so once again let's start again uh, so you got numbers that you want to represent some go from 0 till 2 power um, 7 minus 1 these numbers you can represent through normal binary numbers but these numbers how do you represent these negative numbers which go till uh, negative 2 power 7 minus 1 what you do is you add you add uh, 2 power 8 to each of these numbers and that gives you some number uh, about so like about this number so in this range and that number is a representation of this so to go back from this to that all you have to do is subtract 2 power 8 and there you go that's all to that's all that tools complement method really is and that's it that's it's that simple this is small bit of modular arithmetic with 2 power 8 as the um, as the modulo thing you know and yeah let's make a number we know all of that no need for number conversions signal numbers Binary numbers are presented by a set of binary storage devices. Flip flops are built using gates. Whatever we'll learn all of that later anyway. So right now there's no need to be going into it. Once complement, you never even need to know. You didn't even come in tutorials. I don't think he even taught us one once complement. What is this? Just what is this? <laughs> what putting zeros in front would make the 8 bit a positive number i don't know what he's talking about this is the this is two's complement method right yeah i don't know what he's doing negation is two's complement yeah makes sense it's just 2 power 8 minus the number given to you that's it, that's the negative of uh, your number in two's complement system. Yep. Mm -hmm. Why is there all of this? Any addition of that stuff. Ah, oh, wow. Oh, and there's like also another way of doing two's complement, which is like I don't know why it's taught, but it's also taught. So, what people say two's complement is basically doing is that say you are given um, an eight-bit number. Let's not go for eight-bit numbers; those are too long. So let's just say you are doing two's complement with four-bit numbers, right? So in this, in that case, you'll be doing two power four and two power three and power four over here, three over there, right? Something like that. So, we have been given 4 bits, so this is 0, 1, 2, 3, right? And let's say this is your number, 1, 1, 1, 1, yeah? So, it's 2's complement would basically be, you know, you, uh, you take um, not on each of these bits and you get 0, and then you add 1 to that, so you just get 0, 0, 0, 1. And that's uh, the 2's complement. I really dislike this way of, you know, introducing 2's complement. You should just you should just really do one zero 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 minus that, and that gives you this thing. I don't see why you want to be doing that. Anyway, so this is all he did for this lecture, really. 
Wow. So he didn't actually talk about one's compliment. I mean, of course he didn't. It's outdated. Right. One. Game apps. Yeah. Let's go. Right. Cool. Okay. So let me just tell you the basic question about K maps. So let's say you are given, um, you know, you're, you're given a truth table for some kind of operation done on X and Y, which are Boolean inputs. So let's just call that thing as Z. So whenever, X, so I'm gonna represent uh, two and false as one and zeros. So this is one, 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 zero, uh, zero, zero, one, zero. And let's say that Z is something like, you know, one zero zero one, right? So you're being given this truth table and you want to figure out what is Z using, so like how can we represent Z using X and Y and the operations um, OR and AND. So instead of using these like wordy notations, what we'll be doing is we'll be representing OR as a plus sign and AND as multiplication. So I'm doing the dot, but you know how multiplication is written in algebra, right? It's like a dot b is a times b. So yeah, you know the thing. So every time, it's so every time you see a and, it's so like a times b. It's a and b, not a times b. Also, you could think of it as a times b um, with bits and all that stuff. But yeah. Okay, so let's start. Um, and every time you are doing this addition, what you're actually doing is not addition. You are also taking the signum function after that. So for example, one plus one in uh, Boolean algebra is not two, okay? It's not two, and so it's one. Why is that? Because in normal algebra, one plus one is two, you apply signum on that, which actually gives us one. So yeah, that's what the OR operator does. You just have to apply the signum after the actual addition. Okay, cool. Uh, let's start. So the way this would be working is, um, yeah. So you think of you think of Z as as the addition of uh, four terms. So the four terms will be these x y uh, plus x y bar plus and bar just means the complement or not operator if that makes sense and then x bar y and x bar y bar so why am, why am i using uh, these four things the reason is they are independent and i say independent because if one of these is true everything else will be false and if one of these is false taking the or with anything else it's like taking the or with anything else will just return that anything else because this is false that makes sense right so for example if you have a or b and a turns out to be false then this is actually just b right so similarly if one of these guys is false then all you can what you can do is just you know get rid of it like remove it false is the same thing as zero right that makes sense so one of these terms is zero that's what you want to say right and only one of these terms could be true at a given time right so yeah yeah i think so that that's the case right so only one of these terms um, can be true at a given time if if x y is true then you know x y bar can't be true because like x is true and y is true only then is x y true right so then y bar is going to be false so x y bar is also false and so on so right what that means is just using these terms um, and like using just you know some combinations of these terms you can actually write z so it's weird but like let's just stick to it uh, okay so what is this thing by the way what does this ac actually mean um, this is uh, more or less you know a tautology over here so in every single case so each of these is kind of like a case in every single case your 
value for this expression is true because you're doing or of all of these cases right so any of these cases would work out then your expression will be true so this thing is actually just a tautology right so put x equal to 1 y equal to 1 this turns out to be 1 so this is 1 then in the next one this is 1 so that's 1 and so on you get it right but that's not what we're looking for in in our case uh, these two should be 0 so so you know x y bar and x bar y these two terms should actually not have been there because if they are there then these would be 1 but if they are not there they are not there <laughs> this is this is going to be 0 in that case right yeah because no other term would be actually able to give a 1 in, in this case other than of course x y bar makes sense right and that's why we use this sum of products kind of thing um, so what that means is that the expression that you're looking for is x y plus x bar y bar that's what z will be so z is just x y plus x bar y bar cool uh yeah so what about like something that's easier to guess so what if z was this thing z is one one zero zero you know it's just x but how do you know it's just x like can you do it in the similar way as we did over here so yeah you can look at this x y it's one so you put that over there x y bar it's one so you put that over there x bar y zero you don't put that x bar y bar zero you don't put that so x y plus x y bar that can be written as x times y plus y bar which is you know y or y bar so either y or not y that's true right one of them must happen so then this thing is just x and true which is just x so this thing is just x so like z is x so it's that easy right just doing this sum of products thing you will eventually end up with the with a simple expression you know yeah yep you will end up with a simple expression and like all kinds of um, like all kinds of these expressions can actually be uh, written in this sum of products form so how many expressions are going to be there in this case you have four uh, values that you need right and each of them can be one or zero so it's two power four values so like two power four um, expressions that could be uh, there in this way right and and uh, the number of terms that you can have in your expression are like you know so, so the terms like x y and x bar y bar etc those are also four and they can either be there or not be there so that's also two power four and this is pretty obvious right them not being there is zero and being there is one so that's good and all for just two variables but when it when it's like in four variables or in three variables it gets very complicated so for that we have a, a graphical method called uh Tarnoff map i don't know how to pronounce this thing though <laughs> uh so it's not as intuitive as you would think but once you get the hang of it it's very efficient so let's just go with it uh, first, uh, let me just you know give you some notation. So, say um, you have these, you have these two inputs A B, it's like one one zero zero one zero one zero, and your function f of A B. So the expression you're looking for that has these values one zero one zero. Then what you say is that f A B is summation. 1 so it should be 1 it should be 0 wait not 0 0 would be actually this thing so this is 0 this thing is 1 this thing is 2 this thing is 3 right so 0 is not there 1 is there 2 is there and 3 right so what do these numbers mean when you write these numbers in binary so 1 is written as 1 0 right and you think of each bit uh, being the value for these inputs so a is 1 b is 0 right so each of these numbers is a case then what this summation sign mean, uh, sign means is that in those cases you have 1 otherwise you have zeros that's what this means like 
I know it's very cryptic and it shouldn't be like that but since it's so concise it's also useful similarly over here 3 is 1 1 so when a is 1 and d is 1 f is 1 basically if you had like 0 over there what that would mean is when a is 0 so this is uh, in binary 0 0 so when a is 0 b is 0 f is 1 so then this would be the case something like that right and then you do the usual stuff and just figure out f in terms of a and b all right cool so let's start with our first map and let's see how it's gonna work out so let's use three variables for now not go to the four variable case so you got a b c and you got your function f So you got 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, so you will be having a b values over here and c values over here actually you know what let's do it the opposite way c values over here and a b values over here so a b could be you know 0 0 which means a is 0 b is 0 it could be like 0 1 it could be 1 0 or it could actually you know what let's not put 1 0 let's put 1 1 over here and it could be 1 0 and c could be 0 and c could be 1 right and let's start counting and I'm gonna put counting in quotation marks because that's basically what we're doing over here right put some emphasis on the fact that we are actually counting in binary so 0 0 0 right so C is the least significant bit and A and B are the first two digits in binary and so we do 0 0 0 that's 0 so that's what we do over here then next we do um, 0 1 0 wait no actually you have to do this thing after that because the least significant bit is c then you do 0 0 1 that's 1 then 0 1 0 that's 2 0 1 1 3 then 1 0 0 which is 4 and this is 5 and you see the pattern right 6 and 7 now you might be thinking why did i put 6 7 over here and not over here the reason is look at these over here this one and this one are common if i had put this column over here one zero and zero one don't have anything in common i do that because it uh, makes pairing things very easy later on all right cool and now let's start putting our numbers in there oh i should not have uh, deleted this right so once again i'm gonna put this over there zero one two three four five six seven eight so for zero f is one for one f is one for two three you know yeah so two and three f is one and for everything else f is um zero right yeah so this is the thing all right cool and so now what you want to do is um, pair numbers and pair numbers in the basis that we get the biggest boxes so yeah it, this is like better if you actually do it by yourself because it's hard to explain in such a short amount of time but basically the process is you want to pair numbers so this um, this pair has both ones so you can do that <coughs> what you will be getting is a bar b bar c bar plus um, a bar b and c bar right so that's what these situations are and they have one over there so you are just doing or on those so like it's a bar b bar c bar or um, a bar b c bar and then and then you just take a bar c bar common and then just b or b bar which is one so then just a bar c bar so like this whole thing combined is just a bar c bar and then similarly this whole thing combined is just you know you just look at the common stuff so this is common this is common this is uncommon and this is common so you just do 
um, a bar b is not like this so just c and then you combine these to give us just a bar right but you could have done all of that in a more efficient way by just collecting all four of these ones right and just thinking of what's common in them so the only thing common in them is that a is zero so it's just a bar right and you would have got this directly and that's that's why uh, these like this method is so useful yep <laughs> for now i'm going to explain that much i'm not explaining more than that there are a lot of extra things that can be accomplished with this but i'm not going to explain it there's this thing called don't carry which which is like a variable so it could be zero or one so depending on like what's what's the best uh, like depending on the situation you could make it a one or a zero right to you know simplify your expression so like a don't care this is what a don't care is a don't care is basically when you don't care about what's going to happen in a certain situation basically so like for for this case you don't care when a is 1 b is 1 c is 0 in that situation it could be 0 or 1 you don't care about it so then you know to make it the best what you would do is you make it 0 because if this was 1 you would have to have this extra term of um a b c bar which does not ex at all match with this so you can't collect and simplify anymore so you want this to be zero so that this term is not there right anyway next oh and of course you can also go so you don't have to just collect as boxes or some or like columns or something like that you can also go like this yeah so you can collect as you want oh also and you can um you can use a number multiple number of times for collecting with different numbers it's completely okay because a or a is just a so you can use the same term multiple number of times in your uh, sum of products thing and it's completely fine then there's something called product of sums which is i mean easy to figure out once you do the sum of product thing Yep. So let me just uh, tell you how the product of something works. So um, I don't know. Let's say that somehow, you know, you were given a function f, and you figured out that f bar is like what is f bar in terms of you know sum of products. So f f was a function in A B C, and you have somehow figured out what f bar is. And maybe it's something like A B C plus. So, mm, okay, fine. Yeah, let's just say A B. Okay, A B plus um, B bar C. Maybe it was this thing, right? And now you want to know what's the what's the you know what's F A as a product of sum. Um, you know, like how do you write F as a product of sum? This is like a sum of product, right? And this is for F bar. You want F as a product of sum. How do you do that? Well. you just um, take the negation of this whole thing because that just gives you f but you do this negation uh, using uh, de morgan's laws so taking the negation of an or is basically taking um, taking and on the individual negations right so it's basically the negation which is written like this in binary notation the negation of this guy and the negation of this guy and taking the negation of an and is basically taking the or of negations so this will just be this and this will just be negation of a v bar is just p by the way double negation is just the same uh, same thing right yeah and so you have figured out what f is as a product of sums easy as that isn't it right and there's also uh, something similar to this to the sigma notation for this thing so uh, f bar is ab plus b bar c right and in in binary ab would just be you know 1 1 0 oh wait okay so c actually you have to write 
uh, in there so it's c plus c bar so it's 110 and 111 both at the same time actually and v bar c would uh, would be 101 and 001 at the same time right so f bar is this thing f bar is Uh, so this in binary is what in decimal this 4 plus 1 5 and this thing is oh this was 5 this was 6 sorry 6 5 1 and this is 7 all right so that's what f bar was well f is just this thing now yeah it's that easy that's what this product notation means what this product notation basically means is um, that w that if you write f bar as a SOP sum of products, then what terms will be there? That's it. That's all it actually means. Okay, next. Yeah, I think this is the one. Flip flops. Yep. Right. Okay. Digital systems operate and synchronous. All of that stuff. I'm not gonna explain. Uh, negative going transition. This is positive going transition. So whenever your voltage is increasing in your clock signal, that's positive going transition, and otherwise it's negative going transition. Otherwise it's you know no transition there's no transition over here okay uh, then you have the SR flip-flop first of all S and R stand for uh, stand for set and reset uh, yeah so before flip-flops and all that let me just introduce you to the NAND latch uh, so it goes like this call this as A and B, I don't know. <coughs> okay, so let's talk about this uh, logic circuit. This is a NAND gate by the way. And this is connected to that, this is connected to that. So let's think about its stable states when A is 1 and B is 0. So A is 1, B is 0. Uh, in that case, first equation is that q is the same thing as a, uh, a nand q bar in this case that's just one nand q bar so one and q bar is just q bar so one nand q bar is not q bar right so q and uh, for this case i'm using a different notation for not to you know think of q and q bar as two separate entities and not just inverses of each other although a lot of people think that they are just inverses i would say don't because like their actual voltages physical things so they could be different as well and when they are different that's when it's called an invalid state we want them to be the inverses but they could be the same oh i was saying different they could be the same right and when they're seen that's when uh, it's an invalid state we want them to be different so q is um a nand q bar which is not a and uh, q bar which using de morgan's law you can write as not a or not q bar in our case a is just one so not a is um, not a is zero so zero or something that's just the something itself so it's just it's just not q bar and similarly q is not uh, b or something so not b is one and one or something is just one so q is one right um, so since q is this thing with applying not on each of these you just get q bar is equal to not of q which is zero so when a is one and b is zero you just get q is one and uh, q bar is zero right yeah then when a is zero and b is one by symmetry uh, this would be zero and one over here what happens when both are zero Um, right so when both are zero 
these not a and not b values both turn out to be one so then q is one and q bar is also one so that's something that you don't want to happen and it's called an invalid state so we never set a and b to be equal to zero okay so that's when both were zeros which is problematic and then what if both are one so this is a very nice condition when both are one nothing happens whatever q was initially whatever q bar was initially that's what they will be they they won't be set according to a and b right it's like they didn't like a and b didn't actually affect it because basically what happened was you know uh, not a and not b both became zero so zero or something that's just the something itself so all you got was q is not q bar and q bar is not q which is redundant i mean both of these are basically the same thing uh, so yeah the whole thing that you got is q is not q bar so as long as that happens that works right yes yeah, so that's the only you know the only restriction you have and so it, say initially your q and q bar were 1 and 0 and your a and b were 1 and 0 as well and now you have suddenly changed it to 1 and 1 what happened is nothing i mean exactly nothing happened your q and q bar stayed the same because initially they were following this equation so now there's no reason for them to change it's already stable right of course if they were something else like 1 and 1 and then you changed it to you know changed a and b to 1 and 1 then they would change because they are not stable right okay uh, yeah so that's it that's it for this NAND latch thing uh, oh so why do we use this by the way so you know say that you want to create some kind of memory uh, you know structure in that case this is like very useful so you got a and b as the input pins that that you use to change uh, your memory which is basically q and q bar and q and q bar both combined is an entity that you would think of them as, as the memory right although they are like different physical voltages but combined in, in, in a computer system that would be a single bit right Okay, let's just draw it a bit more beautifully. This is Q, this thing is Q bar. So, say initially you put A and B as 1 and 0 and you set Q and Q bar to be 1 and 0 in that way. And then you just turn it to 1 and 1 forever. Then your Q and Q bar are set to 1 and 0 forever. And so until you, you know, disturb A and B again, your Q and Q bar will always be 1 and 0 and you can use that value whenever you want. And so the way that you disturb A and B is by is by using uh, is by using a using a clock cycle. So now we're actually getting to like what flip flops are. So let's just actually go to the SR flip flop circuit, and you know skip all of that. Just go to the circuit itself. So this is this is the uh, circuit. You got the NAND latch, and you got this pulse steering thing. I don't know what why this name is given to it. Um, and forget about all of this what's basically going is that you are sending it pulses of like uh, pulses of very short duty of highs and lows so your pulse looks like this so for a very small amount of time it's high and suddenly it's like negative and then it's positive or whatever yeah these are your pulses and in these uh, small high pulses what happens is that um, your memory changes basically so this uh, I'll be calling uh, clock star pulse and clock is the actual pulse from which it was derived. So you're sending that. You're also um, setting two voltages S and R. So it's the, the S represents set and R represents reset. So these two voltages you have set. <laughs> uh, it's kind of, yeah, <laughs> wordplay. Uh, and based on the values of these S and R pins, um, your clock will do different things to your uh, memory. So you got NAND over there connected to that. So for example, let's say that your S was 1 and your R was 0 and now you are sending uh, clock signals to it. Well, when your S is 1 and you get a high uh, you know like a high pulse from your clock signal in that duration this NAND gate 
uh, this puts you know this puts zero over here and this puts one over here because this was zero uh, and in that case so you know what happens right when this is zero and this thing is one uh, this will turn out to be one and this will turn out to be zero right yeah and so in this way you are changing uh, the values for a and b and thus also changing q and q bar where is my cursor right so yeah Oh, so it should set Q to 1 and uh, okay, so it's a positive of that. Is that right? I mean, of course, it's right. Oh, so <laughs> uh, all of this time I was like saying it's going to be if this is 0 and 1, then that's 0 and 1, and that's wrong. If this is 0 and 1, it's exactly the opposite of that. This is 1 and 0. And still, when you, uh, when you have 1 and 1, this does not change. When you have 0 and 0, that's bad it's an invalid state all right cool so in this particular case when you have 0 and 1 this becomes 1 and 0 right check check this circuit you'll see it's uh it's working fine okay and that's happening when s is 1 r is 0 and uh, clock is having a high pulse in so only when the clock actually has a high pulse will this happen right um yeah if if the clock has what do we call it was the same oh yeah if the clock is a low pulse nothing happens because this would be zero this would be zero then zero and zero is zero not of that is one this thing is one this thing is also one so if the clock pulse is something like so clock star pulse is uh, something like this you also have these negative pulses which i'm ignoring completely because those are lower than the high values that you want right uh yeah so basically just look at the high pulses um, so whenever you will be encountering a high pulse that's some kind of information you are sending to your memory to change the memory otherwise whenever it's low so when both of these uh, become zero in that case so in that case this is one and this thing is also one and you know that when both are one nothing happens to the memory right and so that's some kind of a stagnant state and that's why we call it memory Right. Yeah, like we use it for storing stuff, you know, storing values of whatever you want to store. Uh, yeah, so that's when S is 1 and R is 0. When you do the opposite thing by symmetry, the opposite will happen. Your Q will become 0, Q bar will become 1. When both S and R become 1 and your clock is high, right so once again just setting s and r changes the behavior of this circuit and the clock high pulse is actually what causes this circuit to take action and change the memory right so say s and r are both one then one and one is zero not of that is um is sorry one and one is one not of that is zero and over here is also going to be zero so when both are zero it's invalid so you can't have s and r being both one that's an invalid state and when s and r are both zero right uh, in that case nothing happens once again yeah even when uh, the clock pulse is high so when s and r are set to zero it's like you have disabled this circuit even though you're send sending it the clock pulse nothing happens Okay, how is the clock pulse obtained? Oh, the clock star pulse, right? So yeah, uh, when, whenever I was talking about the clock pulse, I was actually talking about the clock star pulse. Um, yeah. So he's saying that the clock star pulse is obtained by this circuit. He's sending the clock signal. This is an AND gate. This is a NOT gate. We got the yeah, okay, the clock inverse thing. And you're doing and of the and this, this thing. so it gives low right that's what it should give but then there's a bit of a delay because of this uh yeah and that's actually what creates this small interval where it's actually high yeah got it yep okay 
edge trigger. Note that because the clock signal is high only for a few nanoseconds, Q is affected by the levels of S and R only for a short time. Uh, yeah, okay, right. So PGT is um, PGT is as I said, like it was already explained before. It's the positive going transition that is when your voltage is increasing in the clock signal, not the clock star signal, which is obtained like that, as he said. All right, clocked JK flip flop. So SR flip flop is like pretty easy to understand, but then it has this weird thing. Where did he write the? Yeah, okay. So it has this weird thing um, of one and one giving invalid. So we could use that case for something extra, right? And that's exactly what JK flip flop does. It uses one and one for toggle. So it changes the Q and Q Q bar to opposite of what they are. Right. So this is the JK flip flop. Uh, Q bar is attached to the NAND gate now, like this NAND gate, and Q is attached to the other NAND gate. So this is the SR flip flop. Just do this thing, and now rename it as J and K. And there you go. It's the J K flip flop now. All right, cool. Uh, yeah. So you have a bunch of different situations, and in those situations, things happen. And over here, he's taking clock going down. That's not quite correct. It should be clock going up, right? So when J is 1, K is 0, and clock is going up, yeah, when it's going up, that's when Q is 1, and Q naught is 0, uh, sorry, Q bar is 0. It really shouldn't be clock going down, I don't think that's correct. Nope, it's not. It should be during the PGD that this actually happens. Yep. Okay, so let's try to analyze this circuit now. Um, so once again, we're assuming that uh, the clock star is high, uh, and uh, let's actually do these uh, things first. So let's put J as zero and K as zero. So J is zero, K is zero. Then it doesn't matter what other things are. This NAND gate will always give one. This will give one. In that case, it pretty much stays the same. So J is zero, K is zero. That just means nothing happens. Now let's put J equal to one and K equal to zero and use symmetry for the other case. write it a bit a bit better so this is j this is one this is one this thing is zero right so here's one and one um and what's going back is just q bar so q is so using this gate what you have is not of uh q bar and so this thing over here which by the way is just q bar but negated because it went through this with two one inputs and the q bar input but then you have a not over here right so it just got negated that's all that happened so it's not q bar you know what this thing is right it's just one. Oh, it's na and over there i mean this complete thing is one this is false so then this thing is just one so q is one in that case and let's also do this thing, uh, do this thing for q bar so q bar is not of so q and what is this going to be so this is zero this thing is one which means like this one zero over there already so you know that this thing is just going to be one uh, so all you got is that q bar is equal to not q but you know that q is just one so this thing is just zero there you go so now you got q and you got q bar nice um, so yeah when j is k uh, so, sorry when j is one and k is zero q is one and q bar is zero by symmetry for the opposite uh, opposite will happen now when j is 1 and uh, k is 1 that's when things start to get little weird right so what actually happens is that uh, it flips the q and q bars states so what what has he told us let j equal to 1 ok j equal to k equal to 1 and q is in low state now a clock pulse occurs with q equal to 0 and q bar equal to 1 nand 1 uh, will steer clock star to the set star input of the NAND latch and this will cause Q to go high. So first thing that happens is that Q goes high. If we assume Q equal to 1 initially when clock occurs, NAND 2 will steer uh -huh, 
yeah okay right so that's for the other case when uh, it's q equal to 1 initially right so with q equal to 0 initially what he's saying is that q equal to 1 will happen after the pulse has passed so he's saying that nand 1 which is this thing will steer clock star uh, to the set star uh, to the set bar input of the nand latch so this input right and this will cause q to go high so what he's saying is that this wire's voltage will change first and that will in turn cause our q's voltage to change um, and how does this voltage change well, let me just show you so you have this state initially j is 1 k is 0 q is 1 and q bar is 0 if you change k to you know uh, 1 now so now that's a toggle and you send in a high pulse again right so now what happens is this was already one right? this whole wire was at one and oh no actually this whole wire was at zero because it's q bar that it's connected to so this was at zero and this was at one so now because this land gate is receiving at least one zero this will be one but now for this land gate it's receiving two ones and it's receiving k okay k is one uh, that's one of the ones and it's receiving uh, one from this wire of course and then it's also receiving the clock signal which is also one right so it's basically three ones it's receiving so it just gives us zero right that's what the NAND gate, NAND gate does uh, so this will become zero and this NAND gate now receives at least one zero so it will just give us one so q bar has automatically become one when it was zero at initial right and once q bar has become one well it will propagate like that this thing is one now right and well this was already one yeah because one of these guys was zero so that's one and one now this thing is zero so q has become zero and by symmetry opposite will happen for the other case uh, so yeah when we started with q equal to one and q bar equal to zero and you applied a uh, clock pulse with j and k both being one uh, what happened was q became 0 and q bar became 1 basically and i'm not still sure whether or not my process is correct in this but yeah in, in this short amount of time this is the best i can come up with so yeah that's pretty much it for the jk flip flop what is this couldn't preview file now i'm not sure okay sequential circuits huh oh so we are finally getting into stuff like ALP you know the assembly language stuff so you have the accumulator the B, the B register and all that stuff um, so why do we call it a B register uh, and not like just one of the registers because the accumulator is the A register so it's the first register and it's also called the accumulator and B register is the next register so you use these two registers to store values and accumulator is the one that's actually doing all of the main work uh, when you add uh, you add two registers what happens is that the value is actually put in the accumulator so yeah over here it is basically incrementing the accumulator's value by whatever is the value in, in the b register and yeah so arithmetic logical unit that's what this thing is and okay so this uh, is the memory right so that's like the basic working of like the you know programs uh, in like different languages at least in assembly this was the case that's how it actually was working right sequential circuits uh, commutatorical circuits have no memory okay current output only depends only on current logic levels you see which have no effect initially okay fine 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 sequential circuits have memory while combinatorical circuits don't so for example over here you have um, a and b plus c right and this uh, expression or this circuit is 
it's basically like a function you give it some inputs and it gives you an output so this has no memory but when your uh, circuit you know like when your program starts having memory that's when uh, you get sequential circuits so this was an example of sequential circuit and this is actually when you start using things like flip flops and uh, you know these latches for storing memories oh so this was actually supposed to be read before that one i guess huh well this went straight to it apparently and there's this last one which i really just don't want to be reading oh wow i guess oh okay uh, that was weird right so this is a counter um so you know that every time your clock star has a high value you do something right so the frequency of doing something is exactly half the frequency of the clock actually right or i should say not half it's actually the same frequency as that it's just that uh, how do i say this well let's just draw the draw the things first this is like a clock signal and uh, this thing is a time period then when you think of the clock star signal over here you have a pgt so this is a high value then here it's a low value and this is a high value right so even this has the same time period right um yeah and if you're using the toggles like if you're using the toggle mode of uh, the jk flip flop then your a will uh, like toggle every time it it receives this high pulse from your clock and so if initially your a was like at 1 then once it receives that pulse now it drops to 0 next time it receives this pulse it goes to 1 and so on right and then you could once again like convert a to a clock star kind of uh, wave and then feed that into the next uh in, into the next flip flop and it does that right so okay let's just move that up so what you will notice is that this initial clock input that you gave it and the output clock <laughs> wave that you got um both have different time periods different frequencies over here the frequency is exactly half of uh this frequency right because now it actually requires two of these uh, high pulse things to you know complete one cycle whereas over here it was actually you know representing a whole cycle in fact right this was only happening at the very start of the cycle itself so yeah the frequency actually got halved so like going forward your frequency will keep getting halved so um d will be like you know half of c and c is half of p and b is half of a in frequency and so like he has even drawn all of this out yeah that's what happens and so you can use a b c d um values like the voltage values to do various stuff like you know to count and all that stuff yeah so if you like actually think of um d c b and a ordered then then that thing is actually a binary number which is increasing um increasing at a rate that is uh what do we call it yeah increasing at a at a constant rate yep that's what we'll say actually it's the same rate at um a's frequency you know so it's increasing at the same frequency so like plus 1 every t time period where that's the time period of the a cool so yeah he has even done that as well so you really have to think of d c b a in that order as binary numbers and so you'll see like over here d has become 1 so it's 1 1 1 1 like everything has become 1 and that's 15 and you started from 0 but everything was 0 yep so now you're like counting you're keeping a uh, track of time uh so mod number is just a number of you know different states that this number dcba could be in 
which is 2 power 4 equal to 16 we would change the mod number of an asynchronous uh, IC so by the way this thing is called an this is, this is actually an asynchronous uh, counter there will be synchronous counter later on the reason it's called asynchronous is because it actually takes some time for uh, this whole thing of you know changing the clock signal into something else and that being uh, given to the next uh, flip flop and so on right that actually needs some time let's call that uh, let's call that time as t sub uh, d then n times t sub d is actually required for um, for this whole circuit to come to like the value that you want it's not uh, it's not all instantaneous so if your if your uh, time period of the initial clock signal is actually like smaller than this thing then yeah that's a problematic thing and what happens is that your clock is sending signals too fast and it's not having enough time to react to it um, so just keep it bigger than or equal to this and you'll be good and so that's what happens for asynchronous counters because these don't work in sync it's not like everything happens simultaneously instead first one happens then the next one happens and so on for synchronous counters everything does happen simultaneously which is somewhere over here right so synchronous or parallel counters everything happens simultaneously this is the circuit for a parallel counter right so once again um, for the first like for the least significant bit you're just giving a uh, you're just giving it a one and one on j and k and you are giving it some clock signal then its output is actually given to the j and k uh, terminals of this flip flop and so you're still giving it the same clock signal so what that means is sometimes um, you know its j and k would be one and sometimes it would be zero so j and k also work as a way of disabling or enabling um, your you know your flip flop so if both are zero then what that means is nothing is changing even when your pulse is high right so uh, j and k like they will be one half the time and zero half the time so whenever they are one the clock signals are registered when uh, they are zero it's not registered so this guy's frequency is also half of this guy's frequency and so on right so then you use um, use this guy's output and this guy's output and you actually do an and uh, between these two and you give that signal to the next flip flop so only when both um like yeah when both are uh what do we call it both are high only then will this be happening right yeah so i don't want you to go in depth for this Okay, there's quite a lot remaining. I guess this is a good place to stop. <laughs> I really don't want to be doing all of this. Okay then. So I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye.